Hi there. My name is Lucas Weiss, and I am the host of the Weiss Sports Quarantine Chronicles. For today's episode, I'm joined by David Singh. David is a features writer at Sportsnet. In this episode, I chat with David about his process writing feature articles, some of his most memorable big reads for Sportsnet.ca, as well as his advice for young journalists and writers breaking into the industry. The Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. This is episode 21 of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. All right, on today's episode of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles, I am joined by David Singh. He is a features writer at Sportsnet. David, thank you so much for joining me on the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. How are you? Good, Lucas. How about you? I'm doing okay. You know, just taking it day by day and, you know, th- through this pandemic. And I just want to start off there. I mean, you know, it's crazy to think that it's been over two months since we've had, you know, live sports, whether it's spring training, hockey, or basketball. So I'm just curious for you as a writer. Mm-hmm. How has your job changed with no sports to report on? Oh, it has changed a great deal. It's a complete 180, especially with my job, with feature writing. You need to have face-to-face interactions with your subjects. You need to be out in the field observing things. So with all of that taken away from us right now, my job has been limited to mostly the phone and to doing historical type stories that you know, delve into topics from the past and then reporting it by phone solely. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for sure. I mean, a lot of journalists are now adapted to either Zoom conversations mm-hmm. like this or, or phone interviews. Do you find that people, David, now are, are more willing to open themselves over the phone or does it present a barrier for you as a journalist and a writer? Yeah, that's a... There's two parts to that answer. I'll say, first off, I think people are more willing to talk now just because everybody is in this exact same situation of being stuck at home and having nothing to do. Uh, I'll give you an example. I don't want to reveal too much because I've got an upcoming story uh, that should be out within the next month or so, but it includes some high profile names in baseball. And I did not think I'd be able to get these guys on, at all. And you know, so I threw out a couple shots in the dark and to see what would happen. And to my surprise, I got a text right, right away within five minutes saying, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm free right now. Let's, let's do this. And so that's good. But then the phone call does present issues for a feature writer because sometimes with features, you like to be very descriptive and you like to describe your surroundings, like I just said, but also note people's uh, facial expressions, note their body language. You need to be able to pick up on things like that during the interview because feature interviews are often longer uh, in, in length. It, it usually, and a feature interview where you're really delving into someone's life or a subject can take anywhere from, you know, 15 minutes to, to two hours. So to do that over the phone does become a little bit tedious, but it's not a problem that's just limited to me or sports that feature writers. It's limited to everybody across North America and pretty much the world now. So nothing to complain about there. No, for sure. And, and, you know, just like me with you, I mean, probably I couldn't get you on the podcast if, if, you know, if, if, if there were normal sports, but, but I digress. I'd make time for you. I'd make <laughs> oh, time for you. That. I appreciate it. Um, but I just wanted to sort of, you know, you know, wrap up just yeah. about some of the changes because hmm. while there are no sports going on, it's, it's really interesting to see what sports that is doing just in terms of, this, you know, new normal, whether it's Mm -hmm. Zoom conversations from home with with fellow Sportsnet personalities and athletes, or watch parties, which enhance, you know, Mm -hmm. fan engagement. It's too early to obviously tell which of these ideas are going to stick, but it's nice to see that, you know, media companies are are showing some innovation Mm -hmm. during a time of, of no sports. Yeah, the watch party is a great example. If you notice a couple of weeks ago, Sportsnet had Jose Batista on for game five of the 2015 ALDS. And he was basically reliving his bat flip home run uh, with a bunch of Sportsnet personalities. And 
I can't speak for sportsmen, obviously, in the higher ups, but I will say that as a fan, as just a sports fan, you have to love that. And I think that would stick around, or you'd hope that that would stick around going forward in the future, because it's like a DVD commentary. I've heard it described as, and, you know, going forward, I'm sure there's going to be an appetite to hear what a former star has to say about his potential, you know, greatest moments in, 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 on the field or in the arena on the rink, on the court. So I can see that sticking around post COVID whenever that time comes. Yeah, that was, that was so fun to just see, you know, Jose, you know, he's back in, in his office, just like chilling mm-hmm. behind him. And then yeah. like the fact that he still gets chills. So it, it definitely, you're right. You know, it, it enhances fan involvement. And I think these ideas are going to be really interesting to explore once yeah. sports come back. But David, I want to get, you know, into your career and, and sure. you know, you're someone that, you know, has had a really interesting path to, to where you are now. And you, of course, you know, went to Ryerson, you know, mm-hmm. in, in the mid 2000s. And I'm just sort of curious back then, because when you went, you know, social media wasn't as big as it is now. Didn't and exist. I'm curious if, you know, their focus as a journalism school was on the multi-platforms that exist today. Yeah, so I started at Ryerson in 2004, and social media did not exist back then. There was no Twitter. Facebook, I believe, was in its first or second year. I think when I was in second year university, Facebook came out as something that was just limited to college students. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a thing where your parents or grandparents would be on it back in those days. And yeah, so... The program, when I was there, you had different streams. You had uh, magazine, you had newspaper, you had broadcast, you had radio. And after your second year, you could choose the stream that you wanted to go to. And obviously, fast forward 15 years or whatever the number is, and or 16 years, and now magazines barely exist. Newspapers are not exactly running the way that they used to be. It's a dying industry. And radio is not the same as it once was either. So there has been a shift now to kind of build people at Ryerson, build students nowadays to be multifaceted right off the bat, not limit them or pigeonhole them to one specific area of journalism like it was back in the day. No, for sure. And, you know, for me, I'm currently at Centennial College for graduate Mm -hmm. sports journalism. And it's the same thing. Like it's, it's a requirement now that, that mm-hmm. you learn how to take photos, that you learn yeah. how to produce video and edit audio in addition to the writing and the broadcasting. And it's interesting for you, Dave, because, you know, when you graduate, you have the opportunity to, to be an associate reporter at MLB.com covering mm-hmm. the Blue Jays, yeah. which is a job that, you know, for many young people, it's, you know, hard to come by, you know, yeah. In, yeah. in the industry today. So I'm just curious for that experience, what it was like for you to to learn the ropes of of covering sports and reporting on baseball? Yeah, I will say that I learned more in that one year, in 2008, that one baseball season of being an associate reporter for MLB.com than I probably did in four years of school. You're just being thrown into the fire and you're learning so much on the fly. My interview skills over those six months Uh, took a giant leap forward because you're face-to-face with players, speaking to four to five players every single day. You're learning the type of questions to ask to get, you know, subjects to gravitate towards you. And then you're also making a lot of mistakes. I made so many mistakes during that year because I was a 21-year-old fresh-faced reporter. And those mistakes were good because they kind of molded me into the, you know, the person I am and the, the writer I am, the journalist I am today. Uh, so it's all, it was a grand experience in terms of, you know, being exposed to something that not a lot of 21 year old journalists are exposed to, but then from a mistake making perspective as well, it, it really did help. I learned a lot in that year that I, I've, I haven't forgotten and that I still apply to my work today. And it's not like, David, like there's, there's no young reporters. Like there are young reporters who, you know, who happen to cover teams. Mm-hmm. And I find like the challenge is, you know, for them is, you know, to, you know, to build those relationships. And oftentimes these players, 
they look at a young person and then they look at someone yeah. that's been, you know, experienced on the beat and they're like, okay, I'm going to be willing to more trust this experienced yeah. guy on the beat compared to you. Did you notice that when, you know, during that time as an associate reporter, like just in terms of talking with players that it was a challenge to build relationships because of your age? I would say so somewhat. It, it, it wasn't so much, I didn't look at it as that, okay, this player is not, gravitating towards me because I'm a young person and that person over there is older and more established. I just viewed it as, especially early on, I think I noticed my questions were very simple and my questions were very, um, they lack no depth. And one thing I've learned in my time in this industry is not, not just athletes, but any person you're interviewing anywhere in any field, they respond to questions that are, are, a little bit more deeper and and, and a little bit more uh, that have a little bit more substance to them. Right. Yeah. You have to remember that these players especially are are fielding questions from reporters every single work day that they have. So the better you can do a job of being educated and showing them that you know what you're talking about as a journalist, the more you're going to get better responses and build better relationships. And that's something that over the course of that first year in 2008, I learned, but I also, uh, I'm still applying that even today, uh, all these years later. And then you had the uh, the opportunity to, to work at the Canadian press. And, Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because one of my profs had said, Daniel Shai Davidi, who who works at sports like yourself, Mm -hmm. many years at the Canadian press before Mm -hmm. moving over to sports. And then, he talked about just like the fan, you know, like the family that he that he built there, and just some of the relationships mm-hmm. that he built with, with colleagues that, in terms of that, you know, mentored him and, and mentored you know a lot of young journalists that came through that way. And I, I'm just curious for you when you were at CP, mm-hmm. did you get that as well? Like like you know that opportunity to to lean on some of the more veteran journalists that you could go to for advice and to improve on your craft as a writer. Yeah, so my first go around at the Canadian Press was in 2007 when I was in my last year of university. Mm. So I was on the agate desk. Do you know what agate is? No, you're putting no. me on the spot. I, okay. you know, maybe I do in a different, but no, I don't. Okay. Sorry. No worries. So back in the day when newspapers used to exist, <laughs> uh, at the, in the back of newspaper sports sections, you'd have tabulated sports scores. You'd have box scores. You'd have um, statistics and all of that. So my job at the Canadian Press the first time around was to uh, basically tabulate those sports scores Mm -hmm. and statistics. And it was a late night job and you were on the desk. And I did that for about a year right before MLB. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I I mean, the, the great thing about working any sort of desk environment in journalism is you're exposed and you to a lot of nice personalities, a lot of it's, it's, it's a learning experience because you've got, some older reporters there who you can, you're just naturally going to learn from just because things are happening uh, late at night, pressure situation, games are done. And then all of the content and and in my case, the stats are all filing in at the same time. So there is a sense of camaraderie that you build there that is very unique. And it's something that has been a theme throughout my time in journalism because I've worked not only as a writer, but I've worked in editing roles and in desk roles and I will say the camaraderie and friendships you build, they, they take on a life of its own. And it is a really nice part of the job. No, for sure. And, and, and it's nice that I got to learn a new phrase today, agate. Oh, mm-hmm. I'll remember that for, for future <laughs> trivia nights when uh, there you go. The, the newspaper is, is all but disappeared. But uh, <laughs> I want to, you know, you speak about your editing jobs. And, and one of the, the, the jobs that really stood out to me was when mm. you worked for Metro News. And yeah. Yeah. And, you know, another sign of sort of the times changing because, mm-hmm. you know, local newspapers used to have, you know, a real, you know, big influence, in terms of, especially for young journalists starting out, you know, getting those reps in, whether mm-hmm. it's on the desk or writing or, or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And not only did you happen to cover sports, but you were also the automotive editor, which is yeah. a really fascinating beat. So maybe you can just describe what that experience is like working for a local newspaper that definitely gets to serve a lot of people in the community. It was interesting. So I'm a sports guy, as you know. I mean, Mm -hmm. the reason I went to school was to 
be involved in sports writing. And around that time when I had switched from sports to automotive, I had just gr grown tired of the late nights. I, I was pretty young at the time, and I had just grown tired of the late nights that were associated with sports. It, it, it was kind of dragging on me a little bit. And automotive presented a, a day shift job at Metro. And you know, a day shift job in journalism is kind of the dream still, even now. It's, it's not easily attainable, especially in, in you know, a newspaper environment. So I made the shift to automotive and it was a good learning experience. I mean, I'm back in sports now, so mm -hmm. that's a good thing, but I do not regret my time in automotive. Uh, it just, it taught me so many different things about how to make your content, your writing, your headlines, your, your decks, your presentation, um, make it interesting uh, and make it attract viewers because sports is people, when we work in sports, we're lucky because sports comes with, built-in personalities and built-in storied franchises that, you know, will capture your attention. If you write the Toronto Maple Leafs on a headline or Maple Leafs, people are going to look at it regardless. Mm -hmm. With cars, you have to work a little bit harder because cars are just machines, right? It's hard sometimes to make a Toyota Camry feel sexy uh, or, or, or try to attract uh, a reader based on a story on a t Toyota Camry. So that was a learning experience. And, you know, the, the perks of the job were also cool, just getting to drive different cars at test sites and things like that. So it, it was a good experience. But after that, I kind of went and did more automotive at a, at a different company and then finally made my way back to sports, which, is, which I'm happy about. And, and, you know, it's where I belong. Was the auto show like your World Series for cars? It was. Like, did you, so did, did you get yes. to cover a lot of auto shows as an automotive editor? Quite a few, yes. Quite a few. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and what was your favorite car that you drove in those test drives? Jaguar. I don't remember the type, but it was some sort of Jaguar. And I will tell you that the car got away from me pretty quickly. <laughs> I, I did not. I couldn't control it. It was, it was unlike anything I'd ever been behind, been behind the wheel of. Yeah. Oh man, that's, that's great. And yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, a lot of people that I feel like who are in journalism, like obviously are drawn to sports because it's described as the toy land of, of yeah. journalism and it's a lot of fun to cover, but sometimes mm -hmm. you got to cover different beats. And, and, and I think that that just makes you stronger as a journalist being able to, you know, jump to a different beat and really, you know, test your, your waters and your writing ability and, then you know learn so that you can then get back to sports which you yeah. ended up doing and no. I, I think it's all it's, it's important that's exactly right when i was at the canadian press the second time uh so this was af after i had um put automotive in the rearview mirror oh. so to speak um bad pun there <laughs> yeah yeah Kidding. but i had gotten to canadian press and i was working in the page masters division which is pagination for newspapers like the toronto star and with that, I did a lot of um, business stories and a lot of politics and um, world news, hard news. And even that, it, it, like you said, changing your beat, just reading those type of stories, editing those type of stories, writing headlines, being immersed in that type of writing and content. It does teach you things and it teaches you how to look at your own interests, like for me, sports, for example, how to look at your own interests differently. Right. So it, what it, I do think it is valuable to expose yourself to as much uh, of, a, of a wide spectrum of journalism and content uh, as possible. And you mentioned that you went to the Canadian press for a second time. Mm -hmm. How do you then go from Canadian press to Sportsnet? Yeah, uh, it was it was an interesting journey. Um, I. At Sportsnet was always, when I had left journalism, I left journalism to work at a corporate communications, uh, like um, an agency that, and that was dealing with automotive. And I had left that after two years there and I decided, okay, I'm going to get back to journalism. And so my first job back into journalism was at the Canadian Press again. And Sportsnet was always my end goal. That was where I always wanted to be. And that was the top of the mountain for me personally. Mm -hmm. And one day I saw, when I was at Canadian Press, I saw an opening at Sportsnet for a contract position as an editor on the desk. 
And it was a 10 month contract and it was a, it was a risk because at Canadian press, I had a full time job with benefits. Right. Mm. And at Sportsnet, I said, you know what, that's where I want to be. The position is probably, I'm very much overqualified for that position at the time, but, and it's a 10 month contract. So it's a huge gamble. I could be unemployed 10 months from now, but I said, okay, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to apply. And thankfully, you know, things happened the way they did. And I was able to get my foot in the door there. And that's all I wanted at that point was just an opportunity, whether it was on a 10 month contract or not, just to get my foot in the door and show people what I'm about. And thankfully I was able to parlay that into a full-time position at Sportsnet and then work towards uh, the current position. Yes. And, and, you know, you, you know, you were an editor and then, you know, staff writer and, and, and now your current mm -hmm. position as a features writer. And, and a lot of my listeners who are young journalists and reporters, you know, getting your foot in the door is so important, but yes. it, it can be hard, right? Just because yes. there's not a lot of jobs. But once you got your foot in the door, mm -hmm. was it the work that you did well at Sportsnet? Was it just your intangibles from, you know, hard work, determination, willing to do whatever tasks they give me? Yeah. That led to the full time position eventually after the 10 month contract? Yeah. I mean, the mentality I had from the start was just go down, go get in there, put my head down and just work hard and don't, don't make any noise and just work hard. And I feel like that's what the first year at Sportsnet was about. It wasn't necessarily about proving yourself to people. It was just, you know, go there, be yourself, be a sponge to information, be a sponge to instruction and, and, you know, and then just work diligently and work hard and, you know, not rustle any feathers. And I feel like that's what my mentality was that first year. And when you arrived at Sportsnet, mm -hmm. did they still have the Sportsnet magazine? They did. Yes. So I guess then, you know, over your time, of course, you know, mm -hmm. it moved towards digital and, and, and mm -hmm. more multi-platform. Like for example, you don't only write, but you've appeared on TV. I, I saw you with Jamie Campbell and Joe Siddle <laughs> talking about Bo Bichette. Yeah. Was that a focus at that point that a lot of the personalities and the writers were going to get exposed to the multi-platform approach, whether it's digital writing or digital social media or yeah. being on TV like yourself? Well, good question. So I'll say starting off for myself, when I first got to Sportsnet, I had intentions of just being an editor. I had done editing for the last several years of my career. And when I first got to Sportsnet, I realized I thought editing was what I wanted to be. And it wasn't until my second or third year there that I really rediscovered my passion for writing. And then that's what I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to go head on into writing and pursue that at Sportsnet 100%. I think the multi-platform aspects that you're talking about, the TV and the radio and things like that, I think at, for myself, I think that just comes as a result of the work that you do and the writing that you do and the stories you report. I don't think I've gone in specifically saying, okay, I want to appear on TV with Jamie Campbell and Joe Siddle. And it, it was just a result of the, that story that I wrote and the result of, you know, the stories that you do write and the, story, the, the features in my case that I pursue, those have allowed me to be on YouTube, for example, uh, in the digital studio that we have, just talking about my latest piece of work. So to answer your question, I think that at least for me, the multi-platform stuff comes as a result of the actual writing. Now let's get into a couple of your features that you've sure. written and, and, and anyone who, you know, who follows, you knows, you know, you, you write a lot of big reads, which are, which is a lot longer than mm -hmm. let's say a five to 600 word article on a game or something. So yeah. the one piece I want to start with is the one that you wrote on Andre DeVoe and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, his efforts in, you know, the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. Walk me through sort of the process from, pitching the piece to the editor mm -hmm. to then the piece getting published on Sportsnet because in between, of course, it did involve travel, which yeah. of course we can't do now because of the pandemic. Yes. I'm glad you picked that story. That's my probably the favorite story I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I'm most proudest of that story. So I'm glad you picked it. What happened was one day I was driving home from work 
And this is right after Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas. And I, I was listening to the radio and I heard Andre DeVoe on the radio on sports at fan 590. And he was talking about his experience and he was down there in the Bahamas and he was calling over WhatsApp, I think. And he was just explaining what he's doing. And I thought to myself, wow, that that's a, an amazing story. I can't believe like this should not just be limited to 7 PM radio. This needs to be, or 6 PM radio. This needs to be uh, told in, in, in a different, uh, in a, at a much bigger manner if, if we can. And so I pitched the story to my editor right away. And I said, you know, this is happening. If I can get a hold of Andre, what do you think? And through contacts, we managed to, I managed to get Andre's number. And that night, having me come down and be with him and the global medic team uh, to observe what's going on. Because uh, this is obviously a case that's near and dear to his heart. And he, he wanted as much exposure back in Canada as it could get. And from then on, my, I took it to my editor the next day that I had a conversation. I told my editor I had a conversation with Andre. He's, he's game. And we spoke to my manager. And things evolved very quickly. They gave me the go-ahead. I was on the phone minutes later with the head of Global Medic in Toronto. And he said, listen, David, if you can get on a flight tomorrow morning, we'll take care of you. You're in. So this was a Tuesday, I think. And I woke up Tuesday morning thinking, okay, maybe I have a cool story idea in hand. Don't know what's going to happen. Woke up Wednesday morning on the way to Pearson Airport. So <laughs> things unfolded so quickly. And then from there, it was going down to Bahamas, reporting for four days. And by Friday, or maybe I think it was Saturday morning, I was back home, uh, locked myself in my room, I think for a week until I pounded out the story. And then that was that. Lots to unpack there yeah. because, I think, yeah. because I think there's, you know, it's so, you know, thrilling. I find, you know, as a journalist, yeah. you know, to get these, you know, really cool assignments and then, you know, mm-hmm. you're on the road like 24 hours after you, you yeah. pitch the story. I'm curious, you know, for that story, but just in general with, with your big reads, mm-hmm. is what you pitch necessarily the end product or does the interviews that you do with your subjects Mm-hmm. often change certain characteristics of that initial pitch to your editor. For sure. They change often. Many times they will change. I would say very seldom do you pitch a story and envision it a certain way, and then you go and you do the reporting, and then the story ends up exactly how you envisioned it. I think the trait of a good journalist is not being, uh, not being stubborn. And, and, and not trying to fight the, the steering wheel. I think you sometimes have to let the boat go where it, go where it may in journalism. Uh, you have to let stories, you have to follow your gut, follow your nose, and let stories take you where they do. And sometimes that results in a totally different story than what you envisioned, but oftentimes it results in a better story than you envisioned. What's the most important facet of a feature like you did for, for Andre DeVoe? Mm-hmm important facet. I would say for a feature like that, it's observation. Mm. It's take my goal for that feature was to try and make the reader believe that they're in the Bahamas. So to close their eye when they read it and, you know, read the finish it and close their eyes, they'll be able to picture themselves sitting in the Bahamas after a hurricane is hit. So I really tried very hard with that feature to really describe things in great detail um and that's not that's something that if you read the piece you'll see the uh, the scene at the airport after all the destruction from the hurricane and the the high tides and the water has damaged the airport and scorched the earth the salt from the water has scorched the earth uh, those are all things i try and you know i remember seeing a soccer field and a soccer pitch and the nets were upside down and strewn about on different parts of the the pitch. So those are all things I tried to incorporate in the writing because my goal was to have the reader be able to envision the Bahamas and see the suffering and see the pain and see what was going on there, uh, you know, from their homes in Canada. No, observation is is so, so important. And of course, given that it's a feature and a a big read, you know, you have the time to, and, and the words to set that scene uh, you know, compared to 
a five, 600 word piece that, you know, you, you know, you churn out about, you know, a game or, you know, a moment in, in a playoff series. Like I think yeah. that's the benefit I feel of these big reads. And another one that you did recently, it was actually I think, a week or so ago, which is talking about athletes suffering in silence mm-hmm. regarding athlete mental health. Mm-hmm. Was this a piece that you would have always had right around now or was it the fact that it's the pandemic and this is a part of you know the conversation around the pandemic that frankly i don't think is talked about enough yeah um, the, that, that, that you publish this piece now no the pandemic it coming out now during the pandemic is a complete coincidence and it's good coincidence because mental health is at the top of people's minds now that story was the pitch for it came last October for me. Wow. And so it just took, I had a bunch of other features on the go. So that was kind of on the back burner at the end of last year. And I did a couple of inter- long interviews in December for it. And then more interviews in January, did more research. And finally in February, that's when I went out and reported the story. So, but that, you know, to bring it back to your point about following your nose and, and my point about, you know, staying open to where the waves take you. That story was envisioned quite differently uh, in, in my initial pitch. But in reporting it, I realized, hey, that the founders of this center, they themselves have interesting reasons for doing what they do and devoting so much of their time and effort to this center for mental health and sport. So I, I think I'm going to focus this story on the founders and, and their personal endeavors and their personal reasons for trying to uh, do what they do. It's interesting with that story, like, like you mentioned that, that you pitched this to your editor back in, in October mm-hmm. and, and it, you know, it got, it gets published a week or so ago. Yeah. Did you know it was going to take that long or was it just the nature of the story that you needed to take your time in really being able to do those in-depth interviews as well as the reporting? We definitely knew that this story was going to take a long time. This, that type of story with mental health and, and, and that area is not something that should be done quickly. I, I think it's important to really devote proper time and, and effort to a story like that. So we didn't think it was going to be something that would be whipped up like that. But I certainly didn't think it would come out in May. And I think you know it, it was done in March, but we decided that as soon as the pandemic hit, and things shut down. We just didn't feel it was right to publish that story at that time. And then also there was a bunch of, like I said, there was a bunch of other features that I had um, that were more pressing. Like there was one I wrote on um, Ilias Pedersen mm-hmm. uh, after going to Vancouver. And that story I reported pretty much in between or, or uh, in between the pitch for the mental health story and reporting the mental health story. And that Canuck story we felt had to get out right away because it was an important story. Uh, it was the middle of the NHL season and you know, you don't want other publications to beat you to it. So we had to kind of get that out right away. So that put the mental health story on the back burner just for a short bit. I want to end things off David by, by asking you a few questions about what you're doing as a writing coach with, yeah, sure. uh, with, 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 with Ryerson. And, and I mm-hmm. find this fascinating because mm-hmm. you know, Many journalists, reporters, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they, you know, they just do their job. And, but some like yourself, and I know Shai, who, who is my prop at Centennial, they pay it forward and, and, and volunteer their time to teach the future of journalism. Mm-hmm. What compelled you to become a writing coach for second year journalism students at Ryerson? The simple answer is, Second year journalism at Ryerson when I was a student was one of the best experiences of my life uh, in the field. I'll never forget taking that same class, that magazine class. Back then it was called magazine, not feature writing. It was a beautiful class. And when the opportunity came around to teach it or to be involved as an, as a, as a writing coach in that class. Now I jumped at the opportunity. It was um, feature. I feel like I've learned so much over the past well, A, my career, but even in the past two to three years, three to four years as a feature writer that I felt I'd be able to impart that and, and help students grow in that regard. And also I felt, I felt like 
just being a, a younger person myself too. I thought students would be able to relate to me. And, and that's the mentality I have with my classes, make it very relatable to students. Um, I, I try to use real world examples, current examples that they would gravitate towards. And that's something that uh, it, it's been a great experience. And I'm, I'm very thankful that I had that opportunity to do that at Ryerson. What areas of a young journalist's writing requires the most improvement? I would say in my work as a writing coach, I think I can answer this question well. I would say it's not falling back on tropes and falling back on cliches. That's, mm. that's what I would say. I, I, it's easy, and I was guilty of this uh, very early on in my career. I remember at MLB.com when I was a writer, I remember a couple older journalists approached me and said, like, David, you're getting a little bit lazy with your writing. You're, you're, you're using the same lead uh, twice in a week. And I feel like with young writers, that's one thing to, to keep note of is try to avoid cliches and, and avoid tropes. And I think a, one way that I kind of managed to scrub that out of my own writing was just by reading a lot. Reading and not just baseball stuff or, or hockey stuff or basketball or sports stuff reading business content, reading news, reading uh, politics, reading travel, reading everything you can get your hands on, and reading good writing as well. It's not just about skimming a 200-word story on, on X website. It's about reading really good writing from really good, renowned writers. And I, I felt like the more you kind of throw that mud on the wall, uh, the more a lot of it sticks. And I found that for me, in, in trying to um, get away from cliches and expand my language, expand my vocabulary, expand how I compose sentences, I would say that helped the most. And that's what I would advise any young student. And that's what I have advised my students at Ryerson. Yeah. Avoiding cliches is definitely a great piece of advice. And I know for me as a young writer, like you sometimes fall into that trap. And I also find David too, <laughs> like sometimes you, you know, you want to dazzle with, you know, you know, these, you know, great words and, and, you know, you, you sometimes want to over explain when really sometimes chopping away that fat and just getting to the point yeah. makes a better piece overall, just because you're, you're yeah. telling it like it is. And, and yeah. there's not all these superfluous words. Simplicity is key because a lot of the times we all as writers, any writer in this world, has some, sometimes there's a feeling that, okay, maybe I'm bigger than the story or something like that. And I think it's important to remember as a journalist, our job is mostly to report the news, right? To tell stories. And sometimes readers just need the story to be told. They don't need, like you said, they don't need the fat, the trimmings. They just need the news. And simplicity, it, it, I don't think you can go wrong in most cases in our field by just adhering to a simplistic approach with your writing. And David, you, you know, work with young journalists, of course, you know, in your capacity as a writing coach, obviously these times right now are very challenging for our industry to, to find work or to find, you know, freelance opportunities, especially in sports because yeah. there's no sports. But I'm curious your advice you would give to, to a young writer who you know, is, is looking to freelance and, and make pitches for a story or a young journalist who, who wants to get into broadcasting for what they should be doing now during this pandemic in order to hone their skills so that when sports does come back, they can hit the, hit the ground running and be very successful. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing I would say about the pandemic is that I really strongly believe that I think everyone has their own way of handling things. So the first thing I would say is don't put pressure on yourself because that's an easy way with all that's going on in the world today to kind of run yourself into the ground and get yourself into a, uh, a, a place of despair. So I would say, first off, don't put pressure on yourself because not everybody is going to be able to learn a new skill in two months or three months or however long we're in this, right? Um, it's unrealistic in life outside of a pandemic to be able to acquire like a brand new skill and, and hone it and perfect it in a three month span. Now, having said that, I do think that, yeah, it now is a good time to 
consume as much as you can. Cons go back to old, if you have the time and you're a writer, a feature writer, go back to old features written by your favorite feature writer or some of the better feature writers in Canada, or the US, or elsewhere, and really you know, dissect their work if you have the time. Um, something I like to do as a, as a feature writer myself is I like to, I have a couple journalists that I really admire as feature writers. And when I read their work, I'll break it down. I'll read it once for enjoyment. Second time, I'll break it down, make notes, um, note what kind of observation they're using, note their sentence structure, note their conclusion and how they tie things up, note how they reveal characters. I make all of those notes and write it down. So, you know, now in a pandemic, I actually have been able to do that a little bit more often. And, you know, I would advise any young journalist, whether, you know, you're a feature writer or you're a broadcast, um, you're looking to get into broadcast or even editing. There's all different kinds of, I guess, exercises you can do to try and teach yourself and, and, and pick up on skills when life is at a standstill that maybe you would not be able to do if you were hustling and bustling, trying to pitch stories and get things published and be on the move, commuting and things like that. Uh, now with life taking a stop, maybe that's a chance to uh, look into things a little bit deeper, like, like I just described. David Singh, he is a features writer at Sportsnet with always some great sound advice. Make sure to check out his big reads on sportsnet.ca. David, thank you so much for joining me on the We Sports Quarantine Chronicles. Thanks so much for having me, Lucas.